Welcome to the Blackout Podcast, where I get to talk to amazing people who do amazing things. And today I have DP Extraordinary, <laughs> Benjamin Edwards. Thanks for coming to the podcast today. Thank you for having me on today's show. Yeah, no, you know, first though, before you even get to the cameras and all that stuff, I think what I love is how much of your work you share. Why is that important to you? I think that a lot of creatives nowadays, we kind of get, we don't have too much egos, but there's a lot of egos because you're faced with so much great work every day. And, you know, there's some things that you don't share that you should. I mean, it's all about self-expression and your vision as a shooter at the end of the day. So I think it is important to always share what you can, even though you might not think it's the best, because there always are people who will always appreciate your work. Yeah, I appreciate your freaking work. I was like, oh my God, are you making it look so easy too? Oh, uh, before I even get out, the, the captions, like, what's the story? How do you, co- your, your captions are always on point. I think captions should come from the heart and should come with truth. You know, I'm big on community and I'm big on sharing experiences and learning and teaching. So I think captions have a special place for me. And I always try to be as real as I can with captions. I don't like doing fake captions. Right, or yeah, like, no, it shows. Okay, so let's rewind it back then. Um, before you go to the red and all these things, you, you were just talking with my friend behind the camera. I'm like, I just blanked out because I don't know any of the terms you're talking about. But like, where did the journey really start for you with cameras and, and shooting? Well, it all started in high school. You know, I was that guy that was always filming everything. And I bought my first camera uh, when I was around grade 12. So I started pretty late. What camera was it? People. It was a Rebel. Oh my God, yes, TS. Who doesn't start on a Rebel? <laughs> right. Right? With everything you can afford. Literally right, right. Christmas money, Christmas gift cards, whatever. You know, buy a Rebel. And I just started shooting, you know, the friends. Like we used to play basketball all the time. And that was basically where it all started. Mm. Well, why did you feel, I guess, that... I don't want to say compelled, but why do you feel that need to shoot stuff? I was honestly always looking for something to give me freedom. I mean, growing up, I had lots of hobbies, but I was really looking for something in the arts that could take me to the next step. It's something that never ends. I mean, when you when it comes to shooting, it's something that takes a lifetime. There's no real mastery to it. Mm-hmm. It can go on forever. If you look at some of the greats, like Roger Deakins, he still shoots. He's 77, 78. He's in his 70s, and he's still shooting Hollywood films. But there's always stuff to learn. Mm-hmm. And that journey is just, it never ends, which is the excitement for me, that you can always get better. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay, so you had the Rebel shooting your friends. Where, where did he graduate to? So... I was actually supposed to go to business school, right? I was supposed to go to business school because business was always, you know, the career choice of mine. And then it came down to literally prom. And then that day I was like, you know what? Maybe I should go for the arts. So I applied to a couple film schools, which film schools are so expensive. They're insanely expensive. And since film school is you work all day, all night, you couldn't even have time to get like a part-time job and pay rent somewhere. Right. So I, I I looked around a bit, you know, got accepted to a few film schools, and then I settled at NSCC for screen arts. Mm. And that's kind of where everything kicked off, basically, in screen arts, learning about film, and then also in your spare time, shooting all the time. Mm. What were some of the things you would shoot then? So, the, <laughs> so you know, there's, there's the film industry, which I was working on, and then there's the, you know, I guess we were evolving into like a content creation, um, content creation freelance industry. So I remember in college, the first weekend I turned 19, that's when I started shooting nightclubs. I started Uh doing promotion for nightclubs. Before I could even go to a nightclub and have fun, (laughs) (laughs) I was already shooting for them. So that's basically where it started, where I realized that you could have a freelance career Mm. and it it was just on the rise. So that's when I started doing more content creation and freelance work. Wow. And um, how was the experience of staying screen screen arts? Because I have a lot of people that have been through that, uh, you know, screen arts at NSCC. How was your experience of it? So let's be real. There's only so much. If you work in film or if you're a shooter, there's only so much you can learn in two years. Like, seriously, if you want to be a writer, if you want to be an art director, a cinematographer, there's only so much you can learn in two years because you have to learn the basics. 
Um, now there's obviously there's NASCAD that does their own film program, which is a little bit longer, but I feel that screen arts really just teaches you how to be a good crew member and how to be efficient. And it teaches you just the basic rules of set etiquette and the basic rules of just being able to learn and being able to adapt and problem solve. That's what it teaches you. It teaches you to be a good crew member. Your behavior changes dramatically over two years there. Mm. Mm. What are some of the changes you noticed? Well, I mean, I went right out of high school, so I mean, I was still a kid, right? <laughs> so, like, to be thrown into a class and then try to just welcome to the real world, right? You know, this is how you should act. Like, don't you're late for class? Don't be late for work. You know, like <laughs> the basics, right? Like yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff is just those the, the basics of work. Yeah, always to be responsible because when you're handling camera gear, when you're handling lenses and lights, you have to be careful and you have to do your diligence, right? And, and it teaches you mostly what I learned was responsibility. Mm. So much responsibility when it comes to the work industry and the film industry as a whole, but also that's what school taught me the most. Was there any standout classes for you at the screen arts? You know what? Uh, we had one class. Uh, we had one class that was mostly editing, and that was kind of cool. I mean, you know, to be able to jump into all the Adobe programs, Final Cut. Da Vinci, everything, and to learn the basics of editing and having all that software there. Because mm -hmm. when I came out of high school, I didn't have a laptop, I didn't have a computer. So, how would I learn how to edit? I would stay at school late. I would stay until 11 p.m., 1 a.m., mm -hmm. just to use the gear and the computers that they had there to work on like basic stuff like Photoshop and Premiere. Everything they had, I used while I was there for two years. Because why wouldn't you? It's there, right? Um, okay, so you finished Screen Arts. What was next? It was the COVID year. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> so everybody knows. Wait, wait, did you finish or like was that the last day for school? So in Screen, in, in NSCC, one of the things that the college does is they make you do a five week work term, okay. which is basically an internship, but it allows students from every industry to at least get out there into the field, mm. meet connections, and get, you know, get settled into that industry so they always have to you need to do the five week to graduate period i think this was the first time in a few decades where we graduated in march march february that's when we graduated because you can't teach film online i mean how are you supposed to do that right and then also our five-week work term was canceled wow so no students in all the campuses had work terms so it was a very difficult year for all those alumni with no you know, no final exams, no graduation ceremony, just nothing. They just emailed you your diploma and oh that was my all. God. You were left on your own. Because like the work term really gets you to meet people. And that's the main point, meet your employer. Mm. So when that happens and all, you know, the film industry was on a hold as well because of the COVID. Most of the people, we were just left with nothing. We're left with no jobs or nothing. Wow. So I decided to just find a job and try to figure out like, how to do content creation. That was like the year of content creation. Mm. Um, I did that for a bit. And then when the film industry picked up, I finally got my first job on a feature film called Wildhood. How was Wildhood? Yeah, Wildhood. Because um, a friend, I have a few friends that work on Wildhood. And um, one of the things I said, you guys shot at a waterfall. Yes, we shot at a waterfall. We shot at numerous places. Right. We had about 26 shoot days, wow. but we shot at probably, honestly, like I think around 30 locations. Holy it's, it's hard when it's a smaller crew and you're running around all over the province to shoot, but it was so adventurous for me, yeah. like a different place every night. That was the most fun about it is that I was seeing sunsets and sunrises and beautiful Annapolis Valley, beautiful places all over Nova Scotia. Mm. And it was summer, so that was the fun of it. But yes, we did shoot at a waterfall. I have no idea where it was, but we mm. shot at a waterfall at 2 a.m. <laughs> you know, down there, you know, cameras, DP what, is what in the water. What was the rule on that film? It was a PA. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just a normal PA, just trying to get in the industry, you know bringing people waters, you know, <laughs> cleaning up garbage, you know, doing right. doing that, trying to get the morale high, you know, just. So you, you finished Wildhood. What did you work on next? So right after Wildhood, we did uh, Rebirth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Seven, which was directed by Juanita Peters. Right. Same deal, like same deal, PA and on that, you know. 
Um, that was a great one, actually. His DP was Jeff Whedon, and he did a fabulous job. Jeff is awesome. Juanita was great on that too, and it, it was a great performance. Amy Treffrey was uh, acting in it, and it was it was. Pasha was in the film. Pasha too. was awesome. I Pasha, Pasha is so freaking cool. The first one I mean, Pasha was the star of that film, and so at some point I'm going to make a film, and Pasha has to be in it. He's like, he's good. He's awesome. He was really in character sometimes. Was <laughs> yes. Because like, yes. <laughs> on set, he would be in character all day. And as soon as we rap, he's just he's, the nicest guy yes. ever. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Pasha is pretty cool. Um, so, like, I mean, when you're working in the industry, it's mostly like PA stuff. How are you, like, I guess, honing your shooting skills? Well, after that first rough year of PA and I made the transition to the camera department and that's where I always wanted to be, mm. right? I made the transition to the camera department and from there on, you just climb through the ranks. You know, there's many different positions of the camera and every position is very important and they each where did have you a trade. Stop? So you start off as, you know, you start off as a trainee, which is like, you know, your basic batteries and stuff where you learn all that. Then you move up to a second, which is, you know, slate in camera reports, a lot of organization. First is focus puller. Then you become an operator. Then there's DIT. There's so many positions. Mm. So on every project, depending on the scale, there's different, you know, positions. So I worked in the industry as a a camera assistant for quite a bit to learn the basics of how the camera department runs mm -hmm. and how efficient they are and how important the jobs are. Did a couple focus pulling jobs and then did a couple operating jobs, drone operating jobs. Drone. And just, yeah, you just work, work your way up, right? But it was good because you get to learn a little bit of everything. And then on the side of the whole film production, you know, I was just always shooting my own stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. So that was a great it was a great thing to grab what you what you see and what you learn from the big sets and implement it into the smaller sets. So one of the things, I mean, I'm not. It's not like I'm stalking you or anything. <laughs> but one of the things that really stood out for me is the work you do with Shiny Twenty Two. Yeah. So how did you guys meet, and how is that um, connection? Like, it's you guys make magic. Yeah. So with Shiny, um, basically, when I was way back. Back to the rebirth days when I was really first starting, um, I got called to go to one of his music video shoots. Now, I, I've seen a few of his videos, but not too much. I didn't know anything about him. And that was the 619 shoot. It was like uh, they had one at the chicken burger and they had a fighting scene. So I went there just to help out, just to help with lighting, right? To be a little bit of a gaffer, kind of. And when I went there, I brought my camera. You know what? You're going to hear the story so many times from so many different people with so many different artists. I was like, yeah, I brought a camera to set and I shot behind the scenes photos. <laughs> and then and then I sent, the, I sent them to him afterwards. He said, wow, I really like these. It's like, we should work together. You've heard that story a lot. But like, that's how it started. It's, right. That's actually true. Yeah. And that's basically how I started shooting for Shawnee. And then I started covering his events, doing more music videos. And... You know, it's it's about the connection with the artist. That's the most important. Like getting along after the camera's cut, that's very important. Why is it? Um, well, I guess why do you think you know you have that connection with Shani? <clears throat> I just think that we both we both just kind of have. I don't want to say too like hustle mentality. You know, we both really like to get creative, and we'll both go out and shoot on a Sunday morning. Doesn't matter, like. Whenever we have an idea, we're just both genuinely excited to make it. And I think that's very important. And also it's trust, you know, like I need this content for this promo or I need this content for this press release. And it's just like, I can do that for you mm. and I can make it. And we kind of have a similar vision and obviously like music style, aesthetic style from a shooter works together, but it's about trust, you know, allowing me to shoot behind the scenes, trusting me with getting the angles, trusting me with interactions with people mm. that's that's what really brought our connection to where it is so you guys have also traveled a lot yeah, yeah. Uh, what are some of the places you've been to and what are some of the um videos and content you shot for shani so shani and i uh we've been to beautiful churro we've been to beautiful new brunswick together and we did you know not the best living conditions but we went to those places for the events he was in 
uh, tons of marquee events, and then eventually we went to last year. We went to the UK nice. for a full on like we went. <laughs> we went to Wrexham, Wales, which is where Ryan Reynolds, right, right, right. He's the, his the, team, his football like, team. They're yeah. on the rise. We went to the stadium. We broke into the stadium. <laughs> shot it. We were getting, we were getting pictures on the pitch. Went literally like the month he bought them. Right. So it was on. It was before they were any good. Yeah. yeah so now yeah. they're on the rise. They're at the top, right? Yeah. So it's crazy how that's yeah. just so funny, right? We broke into there. We stayed on a farm in Wales because all the Airbnbs were booked. All the hotels were booked. So we ended up staying on a farm Holy with shit. like a thousand sheep, go- <laughs> goats and everything. You'd wake up to the, the sheep, right? right, you right, right. The goats everywhere. That was pretty fun. And then we went from Wales. Then we went down to London, spent some time in London, spent some time in Brighton for the great escape right on the water. Mm. Had real fish and chips with vinegar and stuff. <laughs> and then we went back up. It was it was pretty good. We were there for around three weeks yeah. in the UK, and that kind of content was like you know, you kind of plan it out. You do your your day to day content, certain photo shoots at certain places. You know, like mm-hmm. the London Eye. We need to get that uh, video recaps of each show. So each performance he does, we need to recap that. So we have proof. We have concepts that Shawnee has performed at these venues, mm-hmm. and. And basically, we do interviews with other people as well. Like, you're going to meet so many people at all these music events that you should be interviewing people. And you mm-hmm. should be hearing their story and, like, where they're from because it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, that was a wonderful experience. And, and some of those shots is, like, mind-blowing. Um, I mean, what gear did you use? We are coming to gear now. What gear did you use? And did you have a team? Or was it just you doing everything? It was just, it was just me doing everything. Like I even the editing and stuff. Oh man! Like <laughs> here's, you want to hear the day? Here's the day. You wake up at eight a.m. Okay, you grab some cheap breakfast. You go out and you. Chani does his meetings with like you know delegates, right? Mm-hmm. Does his meetings. We're out all day. We eventually have the show at night. We shoot the show. We do some networking till like two a.m. and then we go back and I edit until like four. Fuck. He's asleep or five to get the content ready for the next day. And then we wake up and he has it. And I, it catches up to you eventually. Like it mm-hmm. caught up to me. I was so tired by the end of it. It was ridiculous. It's exhausting. But that's what you do. I mean, if you look at the, some of the great shooters, like uh, people who've been on tour with Travis Scott and Rihanna, right? They have the content ready the night of the concert because that's just. And same with like all the festival shooters, like people at Coachella and Rolling Loud, and they all edit the stuff. Some of them edit. I've seen people with laptops at the concert, <laughs> editing during the concert to have it ready for right, that right, night, right. right? For Rolling Loud to use. So, it's in the music. It's all. It's very exhausting how much you do. And what did I have at the time? I didn't have too much. I brought um, a Sony A seven R three which honestly isn't the best for video. There's no, you know, I'm going to get technical, but there's no, you know, 10-bit 422. So the color's a little off, but it still shoots S-Log3. And, you know, it's got 42 or some megapixels, so it's great for photography. But I use, I bring that, my phone, a laptop, maybe a drone and a GoPro. That's like... That's it. That's it. God damn. Okay, so, you know, you come back from that, that experience, three weeks and stuff. Um... <clears throat> When did he decide, okay, I'm going to, like, get into the gear and, like, stock up and build my machines? Machine, I don't know what to machines. call them. They're, like, machines. My machines. Well, you know, like I said, from the past of just working in the camera department, for one, you learn a lot about gear. You learn what's needed and what's not. There's so much stuff out there that will make you spend your money. It's not worth it. You might as well spend your money on something that's reliable and that will work. As a camera person, you just want it to work. No matter what part it is, you just want it to work. Like, that's all you need, right? And there's so much stuff to buy out there. It gets overwhelming. You got third parties coming in trying to sell you, you know, stuff for your camera that could be better than the original manufacturers. So you you have to make decisions and be wise about your money because this hobby, this hobby job, whatever you want to call it, is not cheap. It's not cheap. I don't know what it is with me falling into this stuff where it's not (laughs) cheap at all. Yeah, it's crazy. You'll be cheap on like how much you spend at dinner, but this stuff yeah. you're just kind of like you'll buy it a two three thousand dollar lens and not even think about it. Yeah. You know, it's like it's crazy, right? So bringing that knowledge in is kind of like you know I've made I've still made mistakes. I've still made bad purchases, right? But it's about figuring out what kind of shooter you are for one, and then what's going to suit your setup the best. 
-hmm. Some people are, you know, just want to shoot certain things like, you know, weddings is one thing, you know, music videos are another. And depending on what you do as a shooter should depend on your build and like what you buy. Mm -hmm. So that's the main point when it comes to gear, I think. And, you know, what's and then what kind of shooter are you, would you say? I don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I shoot everything. Like, I'm mean, going to be honest, like, you know, eventually as I get older and, you know, my energy is not as high, I would just want to be a DP. But for like TV and, and film and stuff and commercials. But, you know, usually right now I'm open and I shoot anything. Like I do anything with camera. Like I pretty much shoot everything you can imagine from, you know, DP and short films to shoot in reality TV, to documentary, to music videos, to weddings. I've done weddings, like I've done the nightclubs, you know? So it always changes and fluctuates. I'm not niched. Mm. I'm very open to everything because I like it because everything is shot a different way and you need mm. a perspective for each kind of way things are made. And that's, it's refreshing to, to go from one to another to like always change. It, it keeps your mind spinning. Mm -hmm. But to go one thing to another, you're always adapting. It makes you more adaptive. Okay. So, um, I mean, you know, being open and shooting all these things, building the game, you need to shoot it. Do you always work alone? Do you have people you work with? And if you do have people you work with, how do you choose those people? So, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that I have shot alone. And sometimes, you know, it just comes down to it. Busy schedules, you know, last minute. It comes down to it. I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by a very strong film community. Um, you know, like so the people that I work with on projects. I like to bring as many people as I can. Just because... It's more creative, more collaborative, and I'm all about community. So more people I can squeeze in and bring in, it's just a lot more fun and more gets done. So I've been fortunate to have, you know, great gaffers who are doing good with lighting, great editors, you know, even great assistants, great PAs, focus pullers, like creative directors, whoever can come help out on the shoot for the project, that's what I'm about. And I want to bring the right team together mm -hmm. to make the proper project. Because I think it's, for one, you'll never forget it. And then for two, like I said, it's a collaborative process. I'm all about community. I'm not selfish. I like to, the more people there, the more you learn and the more you grow. And doing that with people, there's nothing better than that to me. That is great. Oh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, you have all these super expensive things. How do you travel with them? Because you've been everywhere. Yeah. So it's about it's about traveling light and traveling efficient. For me, when it comes to travel, anything you would bring, like your nice shoes, your nice clothes, it's out. <laughs> it's, I can't bring it. It's out, right? Like, Shawnee makes fun of me because on the UK tour, I wore a black hoodie and black jeans and white shoes. And that's all I wore every day. <laughs> He makes fun of me for that. He thinks I live in it, right? Like, because he's the artist. He's got like all these shoes right, and stuff. Right. And I just have this, like, well, <laughs> like with another artist. Like, like I was with April in Texas, and she has like all these cool white, you, you know, outfits for different nights. And it's like I'm wearing the same thing, because like that's just what I can bring, right? So, and depends on like going back to the gear. The gear, like if you have a Gemini, if you have a Helium, or you have an Ari or an FX9 even, that's a big package. And dissembling that and rebuilding that, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So these guys can actually be broken down. I mean, a, a Komodo is literally probably this big. Mm -hmm. Like it's tiny once you break it all down. If you learn how to build it quick, that's great. Basically what I do is I have a backpack, which is just my, you know, my MacBook, you know, the essentials. And then in my carry-on, because I don't trust airlines, and my, right. in my, in my carry-on is just a suitcase just full of gear. Right. Everything from sound gear to red gear, everything is there. And then, you know, the big suitcase, if I have to, I usually don't, but if I have to, has, you know, a few clothes and then it has like battery chargers and stuff that can be expendable. Mm. right battery chargers lens cleaning stuff cords expendable but the expensive stuff it stays in the plane with you stays <laughs> in the plane or if i'm waiting my feet are on it you know right, like it right, doesn't right. move and i don't leave it out of my sight but also like i'm insured so like it's good to have insurance for certain case scenarios in case like you know you don't want your gear to be you don't want to have to replace it because you've worked so hard to get it right 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 with the insurance how do you i guess navigate that how do you what insurance do you use yeah. how do you so there's a lot of different insurance companies out there that offer a variety of things like maybe if you break your gear right if if something bad happens just like you know your regular 
business, like general liability and stuff. Uh, for me, I was really looking for insurance that would cover, you know, in case the gear breaks, in case, you know, like something happens. Cybersecurity is actually a big thing nowadays. So that's that's really important. And I needed something that covered me internationally because... You travel a lot. Better be safe than sorry. And if you're going to pay for it, you don't want to, you know, yeah, if you're traveling a lot and you break it, like you're in big trouble and you have mm. to go replace it. It's just such a hassle. So it's good just to have that extra coverage just in case like you're abroad doing a big project and something happens. So mm. it's, I think it's good. Insurance is just something, I don't know, you kind of need it. If you don't need it, then you you would know the answer to that. Right. Fair enough. So <clears throat> what are some things you're working on? What are some things coming up you're working on? So a ton of music videos right now. We have a we have a couple. I'm not editing two of them. Two of them are being edited right now. Part of you know our team, our community. Is there any thing you can talk about that you've worked on or well in the film industry I can't talk about it. Fair enough. Because it's the film industry, everyone's, you know, and I respect that. Mm -hmm. Film industry, I, I don't even share I can't share anything about my life in the film industry too much mm -hmm. um we have a, a shawnee music video in the making and then for basil he's got a new single that just came out today it's his birthday mm -hmm. you know uh we have something being edited for him as well and we're doing a new campaign for a great landscaping company here that everyone should get them to do their landscaping because they're amazing they've been in the business a couple of years so we're doing a whole digital campaign for them a whole rebranding you know, they have lots of services. So we're rebuilding, they're help, we're helping the website builders, you know, rebuild it with our content packages mm. and just pushing the brand awareness. How does something like that work? You know, is a different thing making a music video for an artist versus like this thing? How does that work? What is the process for that? The, the similarities is always story. You know, story is always what carries. Mm. But the, uh, the similarities is a music video is a full on project. And then like a digital media campaign is basically to help push the brand out there and when you're looking from a company you should look at the company's values and their, what they're offering to the world because you're trying to connect them with people aka customers but people you're trying to connect why they're beneficial what they why is what they offer important and you're trying to connect that to people through visual content um, so basic for example their website brand a brand story every website has a brand story Brand story, who are we? What do we do, right? If you're looking for landscaping and there's a ton of landscaping companies and you're going through the websites, why should this one attract you, mm. right? And that <clears throat> content attracts the customers and it's about building the trust of the customer to you know, the person that's providing service. That's mm. important. So we're trying to really emphasize and bring the content up because it's good that every company has pristine content that is very capturing and very true to who they are because in today's digital world that's what's going to stand out most mm. so that's basically what we do with digital campaigns and companies and your we so it's like you did you start a company or yeah so we have a community because as creatives it's important to know that you're part of a community so we have a community uh called komodo dragon productions and Komodo Dragon Productions has been under the radar. We're not too flashy with it. We don't f shine it everywhere, which is probably the opposite of what you would think a, a creative agency would do. Mm. Um, but we're just about trust and loyalty and hardworking community. So it's, a, it's basically a, a community of freelancers that come together to work on projects. Now, the main point of that is that if it's a project you're interested in, you sign up right you get your rate i make sure the rate is there i make sure everyone's up to speed and on task mm -hmm. so that way we can choose the best selected team members to do that project right. and everyone gets along everyone learns right and everyone has their creative input everyone has a voice mm -hmm. our my community does not restrict any creator of limitations there's no ceilings like i don't give a ceiling on you know certain things that would prevent them from fulfilling it right mm. and to learn right it's all about learning and growth right so, so you started it or yeah i started it about a year ago why did you decide to start it well it just relates to just you know i went so solo for so many years that i kind of wish i had a community that i could you know create with so when I, when I go through all these experiences, through all these different niches, right, and find creators that I know are amazing. And, you know, being a creator full-time is hard. 
it's very hard to make a living sometimes because you, you never have that security. Mm. So I wanted to create a way for people to have more work available, uh, to have access to know, you know, to good networking opportunities, good gear and good learning, pe good learning, good people. And I wanted to connect them all to each other. Mm. So that's kind of why I started. I kind of treat them more. I would never treat anyone as an employee. I would never treat any, anyone as a worker. They're all creatives and they're part of the community, right? We we work together. No one works for someone, right? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, that's a wonderful approach. But how does one get in the community? I, I don't want to say sign up, but how does one get into the community? Yeah, so we basically, I want to hear what you want to do. Like if you're, if you want to do video, say it. If you want to do photo, just say it. If you want to direct, right? I want you to pick what you, what do you want to do? And then I basically listen to what are your interests, right? If you are in the, if you are shooting fashion and you don't like it and you'd rather shoot commercials, I'd rather put you into commercials because I know that you will be amazing in that because you'll be doing something you want to do. Um, where there's no limitations, it's just whatever freelancers are always looking for extra work, you can join the community right? Join the community, join the chats, and we can build together. So do they reach out to you or? So yeah, f some people have reached out. Um, I've actually gone out of my way to meet a lot of people, but it all starts out with mutual like connections and like, you know, you kind of know each other's work and then you kind of talk a bit and you can kind of have a feeling of, you know, who's more community than who's more like, I, I just want to work for myself. Right, 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 right. Right. You can tell. You can tell the difference there, right? And we want that positive energy because it's a company culture, mm. it's a community culture. So that's that's definitely important. So it goes either way. There's nowhere to really sign up. You could always message me, but somehow we cross paths, where one party c connects to the other, and then we take it from there and we find out. You know what's the goal, mm. right? What's the goal to that? Okay. So what's a, when when music videos? What's a typical day like a production day when you're making a musical video music videos well it starts with pre-production which is the brainstorming ideas securing locations getting actors getting gear equipment rentals from the rental companies around here like Equifilm and Dartmouth or maybe Whites right whatever happens and then you, you plan the schedule and then you do um, the shoot days and then we go into posts but we try to bring it as organized as possible you know we have we usually bring production coordinators to coordinate everything to make sure everyone's up to speed there's people in place to keep it organized there's people to help with the gear so we want it to be as full-scale production as we possibly can mm -hmm. we want it to be as professional as we can and as organized as we can because it's one thing to plan your whole music video shoot and shoot it and try to make it look pretty try to make it look nice but you're always figuring out all these logistics mm. if i bring in a production coordinator they figure out all the logistics so we can focus on actually sh what we're aiming at, what we're shooting, right? Coordinators contacting people where to go, where to meet, what time, all the paperwork, deal memos, right? You know what I mean? So it's like that alone is such, so much help. Mm. Having editors, right? So much help. Having people return the gear, you know, so much help. And, you know, we've had crews on music videos do that. I mean, not every music video you'll have that high of a budget and that high of a production. Mm. But we try to get as close as we can to so, professional. So <clears throat> if someone reaches out to you, it's like, Benjamin, what's up? I want to make, I don't know, this, I don't know, commercial thing. Uh, do they get you or do they get the community? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah. So as it stands right now, they come to me and we have a meeting. Uh, we, we discuss exactly what's the goal they want to achieve because... Some people have a heart, they don't, they, they want to go somewhere, but they don't know, right? And you're basically, you're that tour guide. You're like that, the person who will point them into the right direction says, oh, you know, I want more engagement or I want more, you know, people buying my product or I want more people to be aware of how great we are as a nonprofit. Mm. Whatever happens, it's like, my goal is to figure out how can we take this project and bring the most value to the person asking for the project. Mm -hmm. Right. And once we get it all settled and like they have a clear vision, then we start saying, OK, so then the idea starts developing and then we start getting team members involved oh. and whoever suits it. Right. It, it, would, it would just be like 
it would just be like, I need a promo for my huge festival. It's like, I need um, posters. Like, it's like you saying, I need posters. Well, I would, I would talk to the graphic designers, right? More than the video people of the community, right? Because I think this, this guy really needs this service best and we need best person we can. So it all depends really. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm gonna let you go because you're a very busy man. I, I don't know where you're going to in the world next, but one word that has always come out, I think we've used it at least 100 times today is community. <laughs> what does community mean to you and why is it important to you? Community to me just means, you know, an ensemble of individuals put in their time, put in their work and put in their passion and ideas on a collaborative pro process that create that generates better ideas, better solutions and better outcomes. The best outcomes and the best values, but at the same time after all that is done, each person of that community just grows more on a personal level, on a professional level and it keeps them driving to become better. Mm. It's all about fulfilling your fullest potential. And you know, it gets hard in any industry. So sometimes you do need those people, that energy around you to, to lift you up, right? And to push you to go further than you ever thought you could go. Mm. And that's what I think is important about community. I mean, where I'm from in Vietnam, it's all about community. I'm from a third world country where it's all community. That's all it is there, right? People caring for each other and people wanting each other to do better. Mm. Right? Yes, the world is competitive, but community ultimately means bringing people together to grow together and to create better work together. That's what I feel like it means most. Wow. Okay. Uh, wow, that was my last question, but something just jumped into my head. Where? What is the story behind the Komodo dragon name? Is it because of the camera? Or? Okay, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people, it's just <laughs> ironic, right? right? This is very ironic that it's actually called a Komodo. Um, so yeah, uh, being part of a Vietnamese descent, I was actually born in the year of the dragon and in Vietnam, the dragon in China too, like the dragon is a symbol of strength, right? The dragon is a symbol, is a symbol of, you know, like I said, trust, loyalty, hard work, community, which is what our brand stands for, right? That's what the dragon really stands for. Um, and Komodo is very unique. Because, you know, just Dragon Productions, you know, whatever. Productions, we chose Productions because we thought it was better than Pictures or Agency or all that stuff. We wanted to replace it with a, what what means the most. Um, in Komodo, if you've ever seen Komodo Island. Those little fucking things. They're so strong. They're so strong. <laughs> they, they come together. They're fierce, right? They're hungry, right? Right, right, right. They're hungry, which is the work, the drive. You're hungry for this. You're hungry right. for more. And it's good that it's like a secluded island, right? It's, it's the only place. Komodo Island is just where they are, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's their ground and that's what they stand for. So it all kind of comes together. It's all symbolism. Mm. Benjamin, this has been an awesome chat. Thanks so much for coming to the podcast today. Thank you for having me.